Kester. It's my album beard. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> okay. it's a beard that I, I shaved my entire face, which is it's another horrible, horrible thing to see. The day before we entered the studio for the Glitter Mouse record, well done. Haven't shaved since. It's maybe similar to the reclusive cowboy uh, facial hair from yeah. Indie Game. <laughs> Indie Game is only one of the movies that we're doing today. What the, what are the two movies? Duck Soup and Indie Game, the movie. You can use the chapters to skip if you want, but as I told everybody last time, I'm really hoping, fingers crossed, that everybody watched Indie Game yeah. and is uh, going to stick around for the whole show today, because there's a lot of stuff to talk about. It was about. way, way good. I was legitimately surprised at how much I enjoyed that that, that documentary. But we got to talk about Duck Soup first, Yeah, which is uh, the Marx Brothers. It's a great it time. Is... How can anyone not want to watch Duck Soup? Duck Soup, alongside Animal Crackers, is probably one of the definitive Marx Brothers films. Mm-hmm. For a bunch of reasons. I don't know if you knew this, Eric, but there's a fourth Marx Brother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's Zeppo, right? <laughs> yeah. I believe at one point there was even a fifth Marx Brother. This is Yeah, there was. Yeah. Thanks to the credits. That was my first question. I'm watching this. And uh, the four Marx Brothers in? Yeah, all four of them. So, you know, as, of course, uh, we see this and I'm shouting at the TV... Uh, who is the fourth Marx brother? The credits come up and tell me who the four Marx brothers are. In typical 30s film fashion. Very uh, good job, Duck Soup. <laughs> also, though, I want to—I don't want to get off on a huge thing about this, but seeing this movie in HD, yeah, you have to understand. So my usual <laughs> Marx brothers experience, in Chicago, there's a thing called Movies in the Park. Right. And it happens, uh, you know, during the summer. It's at a few different parks, yeah. Yeah, it's all over the place. And they just show movies on a big screen, um, you know, projected in the park. Yeah. Grant Park is usually where I see the Marx right. Brothers stuff. Yeah, they just did Scott Pilgrim in Wicker Park last year. Oh, did they really? Yeah. Oh, I had no idea. That's great. Yeah, but I mean, so Grant Park, uh, if you don't live in Chicago or you've never been to Chicago, it's the big one downtown. It's the touristy, right. like... Uh, you know, it's where Lollapalooza happens. Exactly. So it's huge. It's like watching this movie in an arena. Mm-hmm. So seeing it in a home theater in HD, painted mustache and eyebrows and all, <laughs> I mean, it's a lot different. It really is. Oh, yeah. It's not the usual, wow, HD is, you know, it's more resolution and it feels the, the explosions are bigger. I mean, for me, watching a movie this old in high definition it takes those vague details of the stage and it makes you more of a peer with the movie and less of a spectator. Yeah. You know, when you're seeing these movies in the thirties, the quality is so low and even, you know, you're watching movies in the park, you're seeing movies in a theater, you're far enough away, especially with the older technology that something like painting on a mustache and eyebrows, I mean, you don't even really think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, the props, the level of detail that needs to be in the film is the level of detail in a stage performance. And so HD adds this whole new level of enjoyment, kind of like we were talking about on the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Right. Where you can really, I mean, you can study these elements. You can see that they've clearly made items out of wood or out of cardboard. And you can see what the fuck you're looking at. And it <laughs> makes you feel like you're there Oh sure. on the set. It's, uh, it's a pretty incredible experience. The other thing that this film presents, especially when you have something with HD, is uh, you get to see multiple Groucho's. Yeah. This is this is the iconic film where all other Marx Brothers are reduced to Groucho. Right. Everyone um, plays Groucho, which is a great moment. Yeah. A great half of the film, really. Yeah. Except for Zeppo, which the thing with Zeppo is he was kind of always the straight man. And I think we discussed a little bit um, back when we did A Night in Casablanca that the Marx Brothers are generally a musical group of people sure chico we had him playing the piano and harpo you know playing the harp but this is this is zeppo's the singer and apparently groucho is also a singer because surprise this film's a musical yeah right and that's kind of this thing that i always thought was strange about the 30s is that musicals in general were just that's what was going on right you just get ridiculous amounts of 
musical theater creeping into film because again there's this transition going from stage plays to film productions well there's less variety in today's i mean we talked about it being kind of a variety act when we talked about a night in casablanca but we don't see that in comedies anymore where it's a dance number a musical number yeah where do you, you think get... those went I mean, we had a, a period where there were musical numbers in yeah. comedy. There was a variety, some kind of variety act. It was vaudevillian almost. Hairspray. I mean, Hairspray, that was the the 80s almost. Sure. It, it didn't die out as sharply as, as you'd think until the late 90s. You think it was that and, long? And we get these, well, I mean. I guess you th had things like Grease and Hairspray. And, and Cry Baby. Yeah. Um, and the, and Cry Baby, I, the reason I mentioned Cry Baby is because it's a successful film. Well, I almost think maybe those were a revival of the old. Right. But it's still now even revivals fall flat. Yeah. Mamma Mia didn't really stick too hard. Sure, I guess sure. the new Hairspray mattered a little bit, but. But what about in the contemporary modern comedy? You just don't see. No. I mean, no, the, it's just not there. Of the hundreds, thousands, uh, million, trillions of comedies that come out every day. Um, one or two have musical numbers in them. Yeah, maybe. You know, it's there's such outliers at this point. It's very, very far. Yeah, it's beyond not being usual. It's almost unheard of. The other thing with comedy, again, drawing from the Marx Brothers, is there is no group of people. I mean, there are comedy troops, and we talk about troops all the time mm -hmm. on Double Feature. Yeah, but there is no troop that. Their entire style of filmmaking, and I, I mean, I'm talking about the Marx Brothers, that they come into a film and it's never, oh, I wonder who they're going to play in this movie. Right, right. It's, they, they give them a bullshit name and a bullshit role, and then they Marx Brothers all over that shit. Yeah. Well, that's something we saw, too, with um, Cheech and Chong when we talked about that being another comedy duo. We kind of wondered, well, where did the comedy duo go? And those have disappeared for, you know, for the large part as well. Right. And there's troops, but, I mean, you take something like um, The Lonely Island or Mystery Team, who Mystery Team is um, Donald Glover and his two friends. Donald Glover is Troy from Community. Mm -hmm. And they're making films and they're doing stuff. But, you know, Donald Glover is now the poster child and the other two are doing all the behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. Same with The Lonely Island. Andy Samberg is the recognizable face, and Yorma Tacone directed MacGruber, and Akiva Schaefer directed Hot Rod, and he directed that new Ben Stiller movie, The Watch. Sure, sure. But there's no troops anymore. They're not all on the screen, all being Groucho, Harpo, Chico, yeah. and their brother. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you think that's moved behind the scenes? Just a product of the times. We have stars, not teams yeah i think well i think that you can't do that anymore i don't think people are going to keep coming back to see a movie where the same people play the same roles because the characters that you'd have to play have to be both endearing and hilarious and fresh i'd like to remind you time. adam sandler still has a career it's not that these things don't well, exist. Well, Adam Sandler, Adam Sandler was two people in one movie, so I guess that's a troop, right? <laughs> if Adam Sandler keeps being multiple people in movies, or Eddie Murphy, okay. I will say that Eddie Murphy and Adam Sandler are two active comedy troops. But what I meant to say is you see people who come back and basically play the same role over and over. Right. Just not a group of people. Well, and with not nearly the success that the Marx Brothers saw. Sure. I mean, Groucho alone. So... It's no secret that Groucho Marx is the most successful and most recognizable of the Marx Brothers. They're, you know, those fucking glasses yeah, with the sure. the eyebrows and the nose. That's their right. that's his face. Right. <laughs> he wasn't born in you know the turn of the century and and grow up and see a pair of those glasses in the store and go ah I'm gonna pay myself to look like that. Right. Right. He did that, and then the entire world went. You know what's funny? Groucho Marx's face. Sure. Everybody should have that. <laughs> it says something about the evolution of an audience, too. Yeah. There's a lot of factors that probably go into us not seeing groups of comedians on stage anymore. But part of it is that you used to go to a Marx Brothers movie, and you wouldn't know the director or the writer or who wrote the music or whatever. You would know the all-powerful Marx Brothers. Sure. And today we have these troops of people uh, most of the troupe is behind the scenes because I think the audience 
has evolved to a point where they know a lot more about filmmaking. Yeah. They know a lot more about, you know, who who directs a movie and who writes a movie, who's in, involved in production roles. Well, and I also think that in today's filmmaking industry, the people behind the scenes are making a lot more of the movie than right. the people in front of the cameras. I mean, if you take them again, Marx Brothers are a perfect example. They made those movies, yeah. even if they didn't they didn't necessarily write the dialogue. They didn't direct the movie. They didn't block the scenes. But you can't tell me Groucho didn't walk on stage and do whatever the hell he sure, wanted. Sure. And everybody was like, this is great. This is how Groucho is. Yeah, they love um, to see him do that. I think he's very well deserving oh, of the recognition he gets, too. I think that if you look at if you look at the evolution of film since Groucho Marx and you look at the names who have all come out and honestly said that their inspiration for sure. comedy is Groucho right. Marx. It's everybody who's ever made you laugh in the history of time. Well, he did this amazing thing with an audience where when he's on screen, I mean, he's the comedian, but he's also the sharpest guy. Yeah. And you don't see that a lot with um, people who are very well known for, you know, they're buffoons. They're the clown. That's mm -hmm. the, the sure. role of the comedian. And Groucho had this ability to come into a world of straight men and make the entire world of normal people look like the ones who are fools. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there isn't a single person that he's uh, bested by. No one can make a, a fool. Even when, so he's in the sidecar or whatever, that's kind of the gag that's sure. put on him over and over. He gets left behind and he still has a, a quick, you know, quip about it. He's completely unfazed. Yeah, he's never downed by somebody else's comedic gesture. He's just, okay, that happened. Moving on. Yeah, right, right. It's interesting seeing how a cast can play in a room with Groucho Marx. How do you mean? Because, well, I mean, if you, again, going back to whatever script may have been written, mm -hmm. I imagine that Groucho Marx walks onto a scene, starts talking, and the director has to go, that's enough, Groucho. They need to, <laughs> right. they need to give their line. Because it seems like he comes in and just, just like a Tramples. freight train. Yeah. Yeah. He just has so much to say and it's just to himself, but it's, I mean, he's just working these other characters into the ground. Right. Doing this one upsmanship on himself. Not to say there isn't a great credit due to the people who can maintain a straight face around him. Oh no, that I, I can't, I couldn't ever. Yeah. You know, our leading lady in this film, her ability to interact with him at all and still carry on like she's in a really serious drama. Right. I mean, that allows him to, he gets the spotlight, but, you know, a big credit's also due to the people around him who can look at the funniest man in show business right now and not just crack up the entire time. Well, and that's the kind of thing that's important when you're trying to make a fucking movie out of the Marx Brothers, is you need a group of other actors that will make a movie. That won't just step, you know, step out of the light and let them right. do whatever it is they're fucking doing. Yeah, because they're the backdrop. But they're, you know, when you think about the idea of a supporting player in a movie, which has always yeah. been kind of a crazy idea to me, but it, I think here is really apt. Your job showing up on the film is to let the Marx Brothers be the Marx Brothers and have the spotlight. So what you're doing is trying to, you are a prop and you are trying to facilitate the Marx Brothers having stardom the best you can. Sure. So your job, I mean, I don't want to say your job's to be invisible, but if you do your job well, you've made someone else look yeah. really fantastic. Exactly. That can't be an easy thing to do as an actor. No, I, c I can't imagine how you would even begin to go about that. Also, I'm not an actor. So. Well, there, <laughs> there you have it. This film has three, for me, I mean, I, there's probably a dozen, but three particularly crowning moments that i think have gone on in cinema as just unbelievably classic comedy moments the mirror gag is that gonna come the mirror up? gag is definitely Great. i mean i think i've seen the mirror gag in every single one of the whoever makes top 100 lists of something yeah right i'm pretty sure the mirror gag is in all of them i don't even know what the list is well and ama and is that a thing probably thinking about uh looney tunes because we were talking about gremlins not too long ago but yeah. it seems like so much of the Looney Tunes stuff owes a big tribute to the Marx Brothers. Oh, yeah. You know, it seems really sure. derivative of that. 
Well, yeah, the other scene that I was going to mention is the scene toward the end when the war is happening and they're uh they're, the bullets keep or the missiles, bombs keep coming through the 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 wall. Sure. They're scrambling to try to win this war. Just that whole scene is one of those things that you don't really get in cinema since then, but at the time it seems unbelievably innovative that's a strange focus for the movie too you had talked yeah. last week about how uh this isn't going to be a world war ii movie but we're still talking about war right well i think in this movie and this brings me to the the third scene that i was talking about this movie is a lot more focused on politics mm -hmm. and uh dictator or dictatorship and corruption and there's the song right the uh the groucho marx is in charge song yeah that song first off is fucking hilarious but where he he says nobody should ever have fun and if sure if you see anybody enjoying themselves they should uh pop goes the weasel i think is the uh mm -hmm. the thing he says and then he brings it back and the whole if a woman is caught cheating yeah oh my god that song just i think those three things i've seen a hundred times yeah and duck soup i've seen twice <laughs> Well, we're talking about war again, and I wonder where that focus comes from. I wonder why, to, because in my mind today, that seems like the furthest thing. Oh, let's make a comedy. What should we make it about? Well, the war in Afghanistan. No, no, no. Right? How about the war in Iraq? How about drone strikes? Like, oh, sure. yeah, this is really comedy fodder here. Right. In fact, I've seen really off the beaten path comedies that are directly about you know, the war on terrorism or Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and they just, I mean, nobody has heard of them. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're not critical or commercial successes by any means. Well, the difference, the difference between 1933 and 2013 is that, you know, you get this kind of general air of, we're not really at war, we're just Sure. Shooting Muslims. Right. That's a whole different thing. We haven't thing. declared war in decades. Yeah. Um, well, we also had other, you know, it's 19, uh, 1933. I mean, we have the, the Depression and other problems. Sure. I think at the time we were, this was almost an escape. You know, we know yeah. war. We knew World War I. We exactly. We've been dealing with that. We know how that works. Now we have all these other problems. There probably was a small part of people's minds that went, man, if we can only get back to something I know. Like war, <laughs> you know, I guess nobody really outwardly wants that, but you know what I mean? Like something familiar, right? Anytime you have a problem, you, there's a nostalgic thing that kind of goes, if it could only be like before. And I think even when it's war, people suffering through the depression, if they had it better during the war, then they're going to think, well, that was a problem we knew how to tackle. America was good at war. You know, we, we knew right. how to deal with that. Yeah. I don't know if it's a thing where... I, it's topical to think about war or uh, therapeutic. Um, it does seem really counter to today's type of escapism where you just wouldn't, you wouldn't even mention war in a movie. You don't even want to know what's going on. Well, look at something like Zero Dark Thirty. Mm -hmm. That comes out and the government goes, that didn't happen. Yeah, right. I would love, I would love to see the U.S. government of the 30s saying, <laughs> saying to Duck Soup, that didn't happen. <laughs> Doesn't that seem strange, though, that when you go to a war movie today, you think Zero Dark Thirty. You right. don't think of a comic farce. Uh, well, what what comic farce? Tropic Thunder? Yeah, I suppose. How old is Tropic Thunder? <laughs> <laughs> are, there new, are there new war comedies? I mean, I feel like the war comedies that come out all star Larry the Cable Guy. <laughs> we don't have the high-end comedy of the Marx Brothers making mm -hmm. war movies. It's fucking Larry the Cable Guy and... I don't know, Garth Brooks' jaunt into comedy. I'm going to give the audience some behind-the-scenes double feature. <laughs> uh, the, the key phrase that is a coded message for us to move on to the next film is when you talk about Larry the Cable Guy. That is, uh, it's also known in the industry as the point of no return. So let's talk about... Yeah, uh, that's true. Talk about Indie Game, the movie. The documentary. Can we talk about digital distribution really quick? Oh my God. I would love to talk about digital distribution. It's just, I don't want that to uh, get overshadowed by the pretty monumental things going on in the movie, but this is a really yeah. amazing time we're in. And sure. I just, uh, when I find something as amazing going on, I, I just, I like to focus in on things like this. Digital distribution is something happening in fucking every form of art yeah. right now. And it's been going on, I mean, it's been going on for a decade or longer. 
And uh, I remember days when I would try and convince people that this was the future and no one would listen to me. I remember even on our show five years ago, you know, you would always bring DVDs over and I would yep. always try and acquire the movie digitally. And that's how we would watch stuff. And since this is taken to the mainstream, it's opened up all of these avenues and done some pretty incredible things for artists. Here we see it in gaming, right? Which is a place that maybe people didn't even think about it, but right. it has the same effect in gaming as it does in film and digital shorts and music, especially. Music was the quick, you know, quickest, the first one required the least space on a computer mm -hmm. to send stuff. Music was really easy, very low startup. You know, you could get an acoustic guitar and bang out a song and be done. You, you had a, a video on your Kickstarter that was yeah. you doing a thing yep. on an acoustic. I mean, very little setup to something. Sure. You just make the art and you put it out and then people have yeah, it. Yeah, music's easy. Music's easy. <laughs> music It, is it really easy. is. I mean, to distribute digitally, music is the base level. But we still see that, I mean, it's difficult with film. But sure. think of how many online only we were just talking about house of cards on netflix house of cards, yeah even though that's kind of a multi-million dollar thing but there's all these web shorts adam green is doing uh sure a well thing he's done a on, few he did yeah. that he did that entire movie on an iphone that's amazing yeah so we see things like this now and the effect this had the reason i think this is such a revolution is because we were starting to balloon as far as what it took to make a piece of art. It seemed to get more and more expensive. Mm -hmm. Bands couldn't make albums, and you know, movies cost trillions. Let's just keep going trillions. Yeah. I'll never be wrong. It's always hyperbole uh, until it isn't. Trillions of dollars. And then we have video games. Right. And video games, a lot of people don't know much about the games industry, but it isn't that unlike film. No. It costs tens of millions of dollars to make a big budget title and there are thousands uh, if not more people who work for a studio and they churn these things out and then they cost sixty dollars a pop and you know you have a one week window to sell your game before it goes into the used market and it's considered you know it's off the uh, off the shelf now sure. time to work on the next game well and if you want to if you want to talk about the similarities between film and video games now i mean i know that 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 indie game is not about this game in fact i believe this game is one of the games described as shit sure but if you look at a game like call of duty black ops 2 mm -hmm. which it's just you know it's your average you're and you're a black ops First military shooter, guy yeah. and you shoot a bunch of guys but if if you look at the game like tony todd is in it i mean the character design is tony todd right, and then right. he does the voice michael rooker is in it mm-hmm Trent Reznor does the score. Does the theme. Let's, yeah, the theme. Let's get Sorry. our Reznor accurate here. Does the theme. I mean, how much more like a film can you be? The, the difference is that this film has a controller. Yeah, right. Well, I'm going back through uh, Mass Effect 2 right now. It's like my 90th playthrough that's of this thing. Ron Perlman, right? Oh, Ron no, Perlman that's, um, is, Fallout. is Fallout. But right. Mass Effect 2 is Martin Sheen in it. You know, the right. fucking president right. from the West Wing. I mean, it has a lot of actors in it. Uh, Seth Green is in it. You know, I could rattle off a whole list of people, but you're right. They're huge productions now. They have actors. They try and be as huge and epic as possible. But that's also a problem. Yeah. It's also, you know, that's something we've seen with movies where they try and get bigger and bigger and lose their sense of personality. Right. And I feel that's a lot of what indie game is about is, all right, we're just making... I mean, with the exception of that one interview you referenced, no one even really talks about the big games. Right. This is all about the independent development. Because as you're seeing prior to digital distribution, all of these giant studios have to have giant publishers, and they have to appeal to all these game stores, and they have to appeal to wider and wider demographics to make back the money. And then you see franchises. I mean, Final Fantasy is in its 19th iteration or something. Right. Call of Duty has Modern Warfare and Black Ops, and that's after it moved out of World War II. And Assassin's Creed makes a new game every eight months. Right. And they do this and have these terrible rehash sequels that are so unoriginal because the property sells. 
Sure. And these companies are desperately just trying to make enough money to pay for the giant bloated things they've created. Yeah. I mean, we're talking at this point, we're talking about, you know, Jason seven, right? Yeah. Jason yeah. eight. Yeah. We're talking about that last Jason movie did really well. Make, make another one. Put, yeah. Uh, put, put more Jason in it. What digital distribution allows people to do is have tiny teams again, because it takes out that middleman who was, you know, intervening creatively. It means you're paying less people. So your game doesn't have to do as well. You don't have to make as much profit to be profitable. Like they were talking, I mean, look at all these guys in this movie. They're all millionaires now. Their games all did incredibly well too. But indie developers, when you're two guys, I mean, if your game makes $100,000, you both just got $50,000. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, not really, but sort of. You know, that's a, that's a fair uh, salary for game development. So it, it takes out a lot of that risk. And I think digital distribution also destroys the more useless pieces of the game industry, like these used game resellers or giant publishers or these things that, you know, they're not about personality. They don't, they don't help the game be a better piece of art. They just kind of, they've wedged, the, they're middlemen in the worst sense of the word. They've just wedged themselves into the, the equation between the art and the consumer. Sure. Sorry, I know that was kind of a tangent, but no, you're good. Indie Game is a it's a film that's really emotional. It's really personal for me. It's this rare I mean, I feel so much for the people so consistently every time I watch this. Sure. And having this focus on small development, it's very unique in allowing, okay, let's make a movie about the game industry. We're going to follow, you know, what, four people. Mm -hmm. Since we have just a few people, Less people makes everything so much more intense. You know, it becomes more emotional because it's more personal. Like so many of the documentaries we've seen, Dark On, you sure. know, we make it about not about the game or about things in a broad sense, but we inform that broad sensibility. Uh, we inform what this game means to all these people by focusing on two people. Well, and I also think that another powerful thing about the selection of people that they chose is that the games that those people are connected to have a really bold iconography. Sure. I mean, you look at super meat boy, you look at Fez, you look at braid and you recognize it the next time they show it as, yeah. Oh, that's braid. Oh, that's super meat boy. They're different enough from each other that even somebody who isn't into gaming wouldn't go away. Is that which one Fez is that yeah. now? Yeah. Right. Right. It, these people are, very powerfully tied to the imagery of their games which puts them in a very artistic and investive place it's funny you mention that because you contrast that to the big games and they're all you know 90 percent torso uh brown hair or bald space marine with gun and yeah, corner of screen right. you know but in this game you you see super meat boy and you go that's that's an icon and yeah. that icon is he's a created and unprecedented thing that is attached to these guys super meat boy is these guys baby you have an image of that i adore the super meat boy guys you know you see this i didn't play super meat boy until i got this and you want to talk about digital i mean i saw this movie and five minutes later i owned super meat boy that's all it took. i yeah. you know flipped over to the marketplace and bought it braid was a good one i had heard about braid it was oh, braid. uh you remember years ago, again, back in the DVD days, you'd come over and before or after a show, you'd just go, I don't, did or you during. ever even own Braid? I think no. you just came over and played it at my place. I just played it to, played it to completion at your apartment. But it was something that I played a demo of and it was so incredible. I bought it. The game sold itself. Yeah. It was good enough that people talked about it. They said, I have to own Braid. I played it for five minutes and it's fucking awesome. Right. You came over and you were fucking glued to it, you know? Sure. And is we did that we did similarly with Castle Crashers. Yeah. Although yeah. I think Castle Crashers is is an interesting middle ground for me because according to, you know, the documentary, it was insanely popular and incredibly profitable, but for whatever reason it just never it never stuck with me. I right. was like, Oh, this is fun. You can beat some people up. Right. Let's do time travel. Right. <laughs> right. Let's do let's do multiple dimensions here. But the Meat Boy character is 
you know, the thing that got me with, uh, with Team Meat, which is uh, what their studio is called now, is, you know, Meat Boy has, it just looks like a video game character, but hearing Edmund talk about, well, yeah, he doesn't have any skin. He's just meat. He's vulnerable. Right. And he needs this bandage girl who essentially covers it, who makes him whole because she, it fucking completes the metaphor. Sure. I mean, well, and then there's fe- do- evil Dr. Fetus or right, whatever. Right, right, right. That's just funny. Monocle, top hat, a little yeah. tuxedo. Yeah, so the game has this sense of humor that's, it is off putting at first to people who, especially if they've never played games or they're not used to that kind of uh, in your face flash animation. Sort yeah, they of thing. don't have the high score on the C word like you or I do. <laughs> but you don't realize how um, personal and just emotional of a character that is how it's this guy who has this connection you know both of these guys and have created this story about their own i mean jonathan blow says the same thing about their personal vulnerabilities and showing those through their game design i don't know how people could ever discredit games as not being art when you hear the creators talk about well here are my emotional vulnerabilities i wanted to put them on stage is that not the fucking definition of art? Oh, yeah. You know, how much better could you do than that? But then we also have, I mean, you're right, the C word. If, is that not a new French extremism of video games? I don't even know. I Man, I, <laughs> I know that it, it's absolutely undercutting to come on a show called Double Feature where we talk about films and say this. But I don't even think film has gotten to the point that the C word is. It's a pretty... In, uh... in, its, in its vulgarity. I mean, I've seen I've seen Solo now, and you know, it, Solo doesn't measure up to a cock punching a vagina monster. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> no one says no to these guys when the team is this small. <laughs> this is another great thing about small development. The c word could not come out of a development team of a hundred people; they would shut that fucking thing down. You don't think you don't think Square Enix could make the c word? I think they're gonna have to make the c word if they're gonna fucking stay afloat. But <laughs> another conversation for another time. But even in a team of two people, I feel like the c word gets shut down when you and I are pitching ideas. The c word is the kind of thing that the other one is obligated to go. All right, Eric, reel it back in. Let's let's make sure people actually want to listen to this year of double feature. Right. It just goes to show that the things that we know about film exist here too. We see those people in the margins doing the very extreme of things. Mm-hmm. That shows that that idea translates among various different mediums, if not all different mediums of art. You know, the other thing that makes this small development team idea interesting is that the people who work on this, a company has a lot of different roles, right? Sure. Uh, You have people who promote it and people who write the code. And when your team is two people, those two (laughs) people are the same people. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. When you think think programmer, do you think PR person? (laughs) I was just going to say that. You'd you'd never never think the dude that writes your code is the one that goes and talks to everybody else. You don't want him to do that. No! No, you don't want him to stand on stage and give a, a fucking speech when he wins an award. He'll propose to his girlfriend. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But the programmer is also the artist. So you have to have people who code and people who can draw. So instantly, these fucked up ideas like the stuff in the C word or even the concepts of Super Meat Boy. When you play Super Meat Boy, you bleed all over the fucking place. Yeah. And the best thing is when you die, your blood doesn't go away. So as you fail the puzzles, graphically, you can see on the screen where you fucked up and how long you've been trying to beat this puzzle because you're bleeding all over the fucking place. The whole screen starts turning red with your failures. It's amazing. (laughs) But those artists, I mean, you don't have a programmer coming back and telling you we can't do that. You don't have any pushback from anybody anywhere. So you get to see the most absurd, intense levels of creativity come out. And then you start to see the craziness that is the PR campaigns where these programmers have no idea how to rep a game. Yeah. You know, they, you see Phil at the Penny Arcade Expo and I mean, his game breaks and he just rushes over and goes, Oh, oh my God. what the fuck happened? What were you doing? Yeah. You know, he's not, Oh man, I'm, I'm so sorry. It looks like we have a little glitch. Why don't you just hang tight for a minute and I'll uh, get this back yeah. up and running. He doesn't even think like, backup console or no, 
he's just immediately, oh, of course. Yeah, first. Yeah, game-breaking glitch. You know what? Just try it again. It's fine. Yeah, right. Oh, God, we're fucked. We're right. fucked. <laughs> I need a key. Give me a key. Give yeah. me a gun. I need to kill myself. I this know. Is, oh, we are fucked. No, just get away from here. That's why you get characters like him. You know, characters like Phil, because they have to do all these jobs. Or Jonathan Blow is another amazing one. The fact that you talk about his game and it's like Beetlejuice. Yeah. <laughs> he just appears on the form. Right. Um, and he's talking in the movie about it being very addictive. But, you know, anytime anybody would start talking about Braid, Jonathan Blow shows up. So you have this developer instantly in your comment thread. Right. You keep the artist away from the audience. You don't want the two to talk. <laughs> you want to control the access. Phil's an interesting one because, I mean, everybody hates on Phil when you look at these reviews. Right. You're, you're looking at Fez, and what do people say? You know, oh, it's vaporware. When is this coming out? What the fuck happened to Fez? Yeah. And, I mean, that's how I feel about Double Feature, like about not reading our reviews. Yeah, right. It's just, uh, I mean, I, you know, an audience like that, you don't think about that when you go to type that in a comment box that someone might read it. And if it's to if it's to Call of Duty, they're never going to listen to our show. Nobody in, in, who programmed Modern Warfare will ever hear this. Nope. But man, when it's one developer and he's really interested in his, you know, his baby he created, he sure. goes out and looks for this. We do that. We Google double feet. We have Google alerts <laughs> sure, on sure. everything we've ever created. I have Google alerts on double feature, Glitter Mouse, Stepfather Gets Mohawk. My name. I have a very uh, mixed relationship with that, though. Yeah. I want to know it's out there, but I don't actually want to see it because it scares me. Well, that's what I mean. I don't necessarily have to read it, but it's nice to know that people are talking about it. Doesn't it make you feel vulnerable, though? I mean, it just... well, if I didn't, if I cared that it made me feel vulnerable, man, I wouldn't come on here <laughs> for an hour a week and get shit wrong about Ghostbusters. See, I still would. <laughs> that's, that's the predicament <laughs> I'm in. I'm so fucking fragile and easy to upset. And, you know, have my heart broken and I'm still going to come on here and do this. I just feel like it just calls to me. I have to do it. And then people say something bad about our schedule. And I mean, you've been in production meetings with me. Every oh, yeah. decision I have to question. And I go, will people like that? Yeah, I mean, I'm afraid people won't like us, Michael. We should find out who our most avid listeners are and just get them on speed dial <laughs> for the production. Hey, meetings. would this be OK? But that's the thing. I want my art in a vacuum. I don't want to listen to those people. Right, exactly. Real-time feedback fucking kills me. Because how do you not let it influence you? Sure. I mean, we have these meetings, and that's all it takes is for you to go, no, fuck it, it's our show. We want to do this. Well, why don't we just do this thing? We always feel like we have to rage against the audience. And sure. No, we're going to have our video game documentary on here. And really, most people probably don't give a fuck. But one person will write me and be like, meh, video games are stupid. And I'll be upset all day. I don't. I won't know what to do. Did I do the wrong thing? Did I make something bad? Yeah. You start listening too much to that outside audience, and your vision goes away. You no exactly. longer have one person, one vision. An idea we see all over indie game, but also something we've talked about so many times with movies. We like small development team. Like we like director who does everything. Yeah. Because you get to see one person's crazy vision without being diluted. Without, uh, I mean, what's the thing he talks about? Having the sharp corners uh, sanded down. Right. Which is something you see when you have to think about mass appeal. You gotta be afraid, oh, well, this might work for some people, but will it work for everyone? And you make a less intense piece of art. You make something that's more commercially accessible and therefore has less to say and is less interesting. Mm -hmm. We rag on the films that win these big awards all the time for... You know, is this really anybody's favorite movie? Sure. You'll see movies that win awards and go, yeah, okay, it's good. I give it a pass rather than a fail. But is anybody going to buy it and take it home and fucking hug it and watch it when they're down? And it's going to be an important piece of art that got them through a hard time. Right. Or is it just a movie that everybody kind of agrees with? That everybody goes, yeah, I mean, that's better than it was worse. <laughs> yeah. And when you appeal to a, a wide audience, you, you know, you do that. Yeah, well, that's when we start getting into the lowest common denominator. Yeah. You've got to appeal to everybody and make a game that everybody can unanimously agree isn't bad. It's interesting because when um, I showed Indie Game, or rather I mentioned Indie Game to a friend who watched it, mm -hmm. and he came back to me saying, oh, I can't believe they, the guy said that Modern Warfare was shit. And I'm like, well, dude, he doesn't like it. Yeah. I understand that you like Modern Warfare, but... 
it's his opinion to think it's shit. He's like, well, I mean, I'm not saying he's not allowed to think it's shit, but I mean, everybody admits that it's at least a pretty good game, right? <laughs> right. I was like, well, n- no, not everybody. <laughs> not that guy. That guy doesn't like that game. So, well, but, that it's shit? I mean, come on. Look at it. it. It's not shit. He might not like it, but it's not shit. Well, we'll come on here and we'll talk crap about it. We'll both play it. Yeah. You know, it's the sort of thing. I mean, we've gotten so good at just enjoying all art everywhere forever for any right. reason we can find. But you still see these really great creative ideas come from the smaller places. Even if they don't have mass appeal, they think about things that, you know, the moment where he's describing in Super Meat Boy, teaching yourself. Yeah. And it's so true that, you know, we put a level early in the game so you kind of know about the run and jump mechanic. And then later I wanted to double check and make sure everybody, you know, is still on board with that or didn't skip it or whatever. And you do. You feel rewarded. Sure. It's one of the things that did, uh, that works so well in Braid and really in all these games is, man, the feeling of that, that rewarded feeling in Braid of solving a puzzle on your own feels better than anything in the fucking known universe. Yeah. It was so hard to watch you play Braid and not advise you on what, what to right. do. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I know how that goes. You see somebody play and you see them struggle and you're trying to let them do it themselves and you just want to intervene in that. Um, actually, speaking of struggle, how's that for a transition? I wanted to talk about uh, stress a little bit too because that's the other component that I think makes this a really great focus for a documentary. Yeah. Is the amount of... Uh, of stress that these guys are enduring. Mm-hmm. You know, what happens if you can't finish the game? I would kill myself. Yeah. And that's something I can totally identify with. I mean, there were, um, there were moments on Awesome Start where, you know, I'd wake up and code and then go to bed and wake up and, co- and I'd repeat that for weeks. I'm developing something now and there's this fear from myself and the other person I'm working with that one of us will die. That's a real yeah. fucking concern. What happens to this thing we work on all day, every day, if one of us gets hit by a car? What do we do? You look at Phil. I mean, his partner leaves, and there's huge turmoil. Mm-hmm. He would probably say at moments in this film that 100% of his problems in life is that his old partner won't sign. And if only his own partner would sign, you know, there would be zero problems. And then he gets over that, and there's game-stopping bugs. And so those are the new right. life-stopping problem. But it causes a lot of turmoil, and it makes you, it makes you an insane person. It makes you anxiety-ridden. Sure. That comes with a small team with doing all these jobs. You can immediately see the point of failure everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's like you were talking about with the Kickstarter thing. Having all this time, you know, we'll make movies for people. We'll make TV shows for people. Yeah. Because we, we have the time and that's, I mean, as far as our resources go, that's the one that's plentiful. Yeah. So you see that with small development teams is, uh, okay, we don't have a lot of money, but what if we get this done with two people? We'll have total creative control. We'll be all over this. We know how to do everything. And then it just takes a fucking ton of time. Yep. Awesome Start was a huge site and I developed it basically on my own. I had help from a small number of people, and we had a bunch of great interns who did the actual design after I could no longer have enough Mm -hmm. waking, living time to do that on my own, too. But then you see all the points of failure, and you go, I'm putting all my eggs into one basket. I'm spending uh, 17 hours a day programming this for months. If it fails, it's not like someone's cutting me a paycheck every week to do this. If it fails, I'm fucked. That's it. But I think it is worth it when you get to the end and you see, I mean, uh, watching people play Super Meat Boy and their reactions, Mm -hmm. the way they get pissed off and it's perfect, and seeing uh, seeing Edmund react or seeing Tommy finally smile about it. You know, he's on that Skype call or whatever, and Edmund just can't get any kind of reaction from him. Mm -hmm. And then he watches the YouTube videos of these people playing. There is just no greater satisfaction than your product finally gets in people's hands. It's cool, too, that that's a completely inverse reaction from Fez. They kind of appear similar on the surface, but Meat Boy is about being ridiculously difficult and frustrating. And when 
Phil talks about Fez being a stop and smell the flowers game. Mm -hmm. I always have to remind myself of that because I'm so used to being with these meat boy guys and seeing this and how much it's going to frustrate and piss everyone off. And when it does, they're mad and they're creating these, these angry YouTube videos, but that's kind of the point. Right. And it's sort of amazing. And everybody enjoys that and basks in it. Yeah. Those are the, um, the moments where I just, I mean, like I feel for these guys and it really, really gets to me is seeing, you know, their product gets out there, all this hard work finally pays off. You feel like they've achieved something, but also their game is done. Yeah. You know, so these guys, they have to face a decision. Uh, he puts his wife through all this heartache and there's a lot talking about her, you know, getting a cat and can she live like this? And right. I remember programming Awesome Start and having trouble with my girlfriend at the time. And God, I can't wait till this is finally done. We had that every time we went through double feature. It's always, you know, we'll go through the production chunks. And our girlfriends will be like, what the fuck? Be done with this already. Yeah. And you get done. And in the back of your mind, you know, they can breathe a sigh of relief. But, you know, you're you're going to get up and do it again soon enough. Yep. Um, we have a website. It's doublefeatureshow.com. And uh, an email address that is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Um, this was completely unintentional. We didn't, uh, I, I really didn't want to mention it at all. But since your Kickstarter went so goddamn well... Indie game was also funded with a Kickstarter. I don't know if you knew huh, that or not. I didn't know that. Pretty incredible, right? This yeah. Kickstarter thing, man. Kickstarter works. Yeah, you um, you guys did phenomenally well. The, yeah, uh, we look, we we. Uh, it was scary though. I mean, Kickstarter is one of those things where you agree that for a month you're going to be terrified. But it's good. It's uh, it's a good kind of terrifying. At the end, you. I mean. Could it have really gone any better? No, I don't think so. Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> and, you know, let me tell you another thing, too, from, from the other side of this. Because if, if we haven't made this clear, like, I don't have anything to do with Glitter Mouse. Mm -hmm. I did film that, uh, that video we talked about a while ago. Right. But aside from yeah. writing one baseline for you guys once on accident, right. there's really... <laughs> uh, so I went on and I played my part and I decided, all right, I'm going to find out about this Kickstarter thing. I'm going to fucking promote your band. And I went on and I made a pledge and it's kind of like the eBay thing, man. Like you get invested. Yeah. Like what the fuck do I care if you get a bunch of money? But I was still on Kickstarter hitting refresh like every couple hours. Yeah. I was still on there like, oh my God, are they going to make it? Is my, <laughs> is my pledge going to do something? Like suddenly you have hundreds of people have pledged and they're all invested too. Yeah. It gets back to the eBay thing we talked about where you invest more money than you probably should because now it's your auction and right. it's your fucking thing you're going to win. <laughs> I'll show those other guys. We're going to beat this thing. It's amazing the kind of unity you can get behind that. Um, what are we doing next time on the show? Oh, man. Next time we're going to do uh, a couple of comedy movies directed by comedians who shouldn't direct films, I think. <laughs> Great. Um, you know, actually, no, I think that's probably the wrong way to look at it. Two comedy movies directed by comedians who should direct more films. Great. I like that better. I don't even know what we're talking about. We're doing Dirty Work, which is directed by Bob Saget, and Pootie Tang, which is directed by the Louis C.K., Oh, man, we finally get to talk about Louis C.K. as well. Yeah. I've never seen a Bob Saget-directed film. Oh, man, Dirty Work stars Norm MacDonald. You're going to have a fucking blast. Awesome. Watch more fucking film. Bye.